welcome on Conversations with Green Change Makers in Japan. I'm Helen, the founder of Modana in Transition, and I will be your host on this podcast. The goal of this discussion is to bring along passionate individuals to talk about various topics around ecology and well-being in Japan. This episode is a collaboration between Motaina in Transition, Fab Cafe Tokyo, and Global Goals Jam Tokyo. Today, I'm welcoming Noriko Shindo, co-founder and CEO of Vegino, a bilingual, non-for-profit website and group that aims to spread a plant-based lifestyle in Japan. She will tell us more about her story and how we can adopt a plant-based diet while living in Japan. I'm now leaving you with our guests. Enjoy the discussion! So, um, Noli, can you explain for some people who might not know what exactly is a plant-based diet and maybe what's the difference between plant-based diet and plant-based lifestyle or veganism? Um, so yeah, just a quick sort of explanation on what plant-based diet is. Um, it's a diet choice that is um, solely based on consuming plant-based uh, products. And what that means is it basically excludes um, any products that are coming from animals or are byproducts of animals. For example, if it's an animal, then it's meat uh, because you need to kill the life of the animal to get the meat or fish. Um, and then byproduct is anything like uh, milk, so dairy. Uh, eggs is also another example. And the difference with that, between that and a plant-based lifestyle that's the first one, is you're limiting it only to your diet. So you could still be eating fully plant-based diet, but maybe wear leather for fashion, which is made out of cows. So that would be the biggest difference. And then the difference between veganism and plant-based, this you'll get different answers based on who you ask. But personal, my personal view is that um, there is a difference. So you can be both plant-based and vegan, but just because somebody tells you that they're plant-based, Um, does not mean that uh, they are vegan. And what that means is that I like to think of veganism as more of a social and conscious movement. Um, it did start originally in the 1940s in the UK as a way to boycott the meat industry, mainly extended to the dairy industry, for primarily for animal welfare, how they were treated, how they were killed, whatnot. And so I think it still is a boycott movement. Um, and so even though a vegan will end up probably eating 100% plant-based, um, because that basically is where the overlap is. I think you don't have to be um, a vegan to be plant-based. And especially my personal view and how we view it at Vagino is that, you know, there's different lifestyles, different um, preferences. Also, everybody has different bodies and health conditions, genetic conditions. And so, you know, you're plant-based, you can say that you're plant-based, even if you have like half your meals being 100% plant-based. Uh, if you do meat-free Mondays, I'd like you to do it more than once a week, but, you know, I think you can still say plant-based. Can you tell us uh, how you actually made the transition to a plant-based diet and what was your motivation behind that? Yeah, so <laughs> given the context and theme of today's uh, talk, I would love to say I did it for the planet and for the animals. Uh, to be honest, I didn't. Um, I'll be honest. <laughs> it was curiosity. Um, I found out about the concept about three, four years ago now, and I just decided to give it a try. I stayed because I felt really good after a couple of weeks um, into a 100% plant-based diet. I was feeling lighter. I lost a little bit of weight, so I was never on the fat side. <laughs> um, and then my skin started feeling better. Like, I just thought, why go back? At the same time, I had concerns around my health. Like, am I okay to never eat meat and all the protein that uh, people say is really important for you. And so when I started looking up um, those kinds of things, I ran into the various implications of eating um, animal products, such as the impact to the environment, uh, which I think we'll talk about today, and the impact to the animals themselves, as well as, as, well as a few other sort of social problems that um, are quite big in the world, I realized they're quite connected um, to eating meat or not eating meat. And so that's how I sort of stayed and never really looked back. So I guess from what you said, like it's through the, your transition that you became aware of the climate change issue or was it the start of your ecological transition in a way? 
In a way, yes. Um, I was always, I like to think of myself as a little bit conscious, like I would save a plastic bag or uh, I like to go scuba diving. So when I hear about the coral reefs and they were a lot better a couple of years ago and it's all due to climate change and global warming, uh, it was always on my mind. But yes, like I think I really, the wake up call was when I started looking up all these things uh, to do with my plant-based transition. And I realized, well, it's, there's a lot more we have to do, but there's a lot more that we can do. And so you started mentioning it a little bit, but can you tell us a bit more in detail, you know, how you think a plant-based lifestyle or diet, let's say, can have a positive impact on the environment? So just one thing, again, it's my personal view. Sadly, I think that it's very hard to make a positive impact to the environment. I think we can do the best we can to make that zero or um, make our impact uh, minimal. And in that regard, I do think that plant-based diet is the most effective way to contribute or not contribute to the negative effects. And it's not just me who's saying this. There's a lot of science out there. Uh, I think if you like studies, then um, I can share this later. But in 2018, Oxford University researchers came up with the same conclusion. And they said, you know, you can bike to work, take public transportation, stop flying around the globe and try and save all those carbon emissions, but it's not as effective as going plant-based. So there's a lot of factors contributing to climate change and global warming. One of the biggest ones that everyone hears about is carbon dioxide, which is actually one part of um, the whole greenhouse gas uh, emission. There's also other types of gases that have similar effects of trapping heat and warming up the planet. And if you look at that, then actually transportation uh, globally put together contributes to around 20%, give or take a few percent um, of the total greenhouse gas emissions that humans create or produce. Whereas the livestock and sort of the animal industry, the industry that is there because we eat animal products, uh, on a low end of an estimate, it's like 20 something percent. On a higher estimate, these vary on studies, it's about 51 percent. And that even the number of 51 percent doesn't really consider the transportation that is required to, let's say, transport beef uh, raised in Brazil to the US, Australian beef to Japan, doesn't consider that. So if you're going to take that into account, then you probably could be you know, contributing to 60 percent of, of global greenhouse emissions just by eating meat eggs, dairy. Not to mention, uh, there's also the water and land usage that these industries take up. Again, stats vary, but water is anywhere between 30-40%. So total water usage that humans use, shower, aquariums, swimming pools, you name it, 30-40% to of that is actually used for the animals, whether to let them drink it or to rear their, grow their crops. And then land usage is also the same total of, um, if you look at total land usage or the total land that we have available for anything, we're using a 30 to 40% of that on that industry. And that has a lot of implications on the environment, mainly. And uh, on a more personal level, you started mentioning, you know, the effect uh, this had on you, but what are the health benefits uh, of uh, moving to that diet? Yeah, there's a lot. I think the commonly science-backed ones, um, are lower cholesterol. Um, this is because only animal products have cholesterol. Lower chance of coronary disease, cancer, better gut health, and gut health is directly related to better immune system. And again, almost no hormonal imbalances. So a lot of these animals have some kind of hormones injected in them to make them grow faster or to yield more milk, for example. And so you're not totally disconnected from that when you eat those animals. And so all of that is typically, all of those benefits you typically get if you go to a plant-based diet. However, I will, I'm always careful when I say this because I've had some complaints from people who have turned vegan and then they gain weight and they got unhealthy. I will say that these benefits only happen if you do 100% plant-based diet, plus the plant-based foods have to be as whole food as possible, uh, which means it's not fried up or you don't have white sugar in there or you don't have white wheat in there. If that's difficult as well, processed food is typically anything that has the ingredients list is you know longer than like 10 ingredients, then already it's processed. You can say that it's processed. Um, so as long as you stay away from that and the animal products, then you do get most of these health benefits and it is proven by a lot of science. 
And so, in your opinion, you started mentioning it, but what are the main issues with today's global meat production or fishing or dairy industry? Like, what are the problems with these? It's hard to say what the main issue is, but I do think that if you look at global meat industry and together with the dairy industry, uh, they are the largest contributors of global greenhouse gas emissions. Sorry, all the animal products are, but then of that the ones that have cows, so um, cattle, beef, and dairy are the largest contributors. And it's because cattle fart a lot, they're big, and uh, the gas that they excrete into the air actually have um, a higher efficiency of trapping heat than the carbon dioxide that everyone keeps making the enemy. It's actually 80-something times more effective at trapping heat and stays in the air couple years longer. And so it's actually worse, a lot worse than CO2. And there's a lot more of it. And then, of course, there's the land and water usage. But I think the main ones would come from the global warming perspectives of it. There is also the uh, fish. So fish, I used to think was harmless, even after turning plumless. But looking into it, I have changed my mind. And that's because while fishing, it's, it's not something that contributes directly to the gas or the global warming per se uh, with any kind of um, gas emission, except for the boats that go fishing. They are one of the biggest contributors of um, disrupting the marine ecology. And what that means is that I think everyone has knows here like basic science enough to know that if you have the food chain and you eliminate any one of the species, from the food chain, then you're disrupting basically the whole food chain and basically the whole lot of animals and creatures that live in the sea. And then those start changing the landscape of the sea, starting from uh, bacteria and then bigger fish. And then if the bacteria is affected, what that happens is it actually contributes directly to um, global warming. And so in a way, it's also another direct contributor to global warming. Um, The other massive... I would say problem with fishing is the plastic. So now I'm frustrated with the let's swap our straws for paper straws and let's have less plastic bags. I think it's better than doing nothing. But if you look at the amount of plastic in the oceans, again, this is an estimate. um, So, you know, it's not like the exact number, but straws, plastic straws um, in the ocean accounts for a few percent of total plastic waste in the ocean. And yes, some of them do kill the the turtles, but it's still a few percent. Whereas the plastic that comes from the fishing nets that um, fishermen leave behind, other kinds of plastic that fishermen leave behind, um, it is estimated to account for 30 to 40 percent of total plastic waste in the ocean. And so just by eating fish and then swapping your straws, you're not like... The effect of it is, why can't you just stop eating fish, is, is how I see it. And so, yeah, that, those are, the, I think, the main sort of reasons, the main issues with uh, meat and, and fish production. And I guess also, like, today when we eat fish, there's so much microplastics uh, inside of the food chain that we end up eating more plastics. Yeah, and I don't think anyone really wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So uh, you started your your transition from plant-based diets and from then you started Vegino. Can you tell us a bit more how and why you started Vegino and what kind of services in a way you're uh, providing? So I was planning to be a very quiet vegan. I am also vegan, by the way, but um, I was planning to be a very quiet vegan where it was just my personal choice. And say, if I went out with friends, I would eat meat. That's kind of how it planned out in the beginning. But various reasons, it didn't really work out for me, for my health. And so I ended up being 100% plant-based all the time. But I actually enjoyed it. And so I would kind of not brag about it, but I guess, you know, I would tell my friend or I would tell my mother who I lived with at the time, about all the interesting foods that I've encountered, like the fake cheese or the, I don't know, the cream cheese that was not made out of milk. I started making stuff. One of the first things I made at home was gyoza. And I was like, I was taken aback by how you don't need meat to something like that to be tasty. 
and started bragging about that as well to my mother and my friend. Basically what happened was that after a couple of months, uh, my mother, who was really against me going 100% plant-based, started cooking for me. Uh, one of her first creations to turn something plant-based was a cream sauce pasta, 100% plant-based. Uh, she enjoyed that challenge. And then she herself also started eating less animal products. She still is almost 100% off um, meat and only consumes eggs every now and then. And then I had this other friend who um, one day said to me, you know, with all this talk of all the benefits and fun, I feel like I'm missing out. I need to try. So he's a Catholic. Uh, he's also one of the co-founders of Vigino. He said, you know what, I'm going to just try being uh, plant-based for Lent. This was about three years ago. And I said, okay. And then what I realized is that, hey, you know, you don't have to talk about all the serious implications of um, eating animals or preach. It is important, but I guess, you know, just influencing people in a way that makes it sound fun, interesting, challenging, whatever it is, is enough to get people curious and try. And then what I realize is that when people try, my mother is to this day, like I said, um, off a lot of animal products and Jad is a now complete vegetarian. Um, I realized that when you try because of the various benefits you feel on yourself, mainly health, you kind of stick. So that's kind of how I thought, why can't I just do this on a larger scale, either on a website or on a blog? Um, and that's kind of how Vagino started. And then sort of what we do today is it is non-for-profit. So we try to be sort of like that friend, like what I was to my mother and to Jad, um, somebody who's bragging about how fun it is, but also Every now and again, I'm putting a fact or two out there that, hey, like, it contributes to global warming if you eat meat and things like that. And, you know, trying to kind of invite people to try plant-based. We don't offer any paid services, but we are always happy to take on any consulting, um, especially for individuals who don't have that particular plant-based friend with them next to them. We're not that fast at updating all our recipes and blogs. All of us have a full-time job. And so, you know, consulting is also something that we're happy to do where we can actually be that friend to help you navigate how you can be plant-based, especially in Japan where as I think everyone who's called know, is um, plant-based or veganism is still not a very famous concept. So that's kind of how it all started. To uh, a friend that would be interested, like what advice would you give uh, this person to start, you know, exploring a plant-based diet? I think it depends how you want to start as well. I personally went 100% from day one because I was curious and I kind of do that. Um, I tend to do that. But I do realize that that's not going to work for everyone. And so if you're curious to do 100%, then by all means do. Um, I can share some good documentaries and books that are both practical and informative to help you do that in terms of, you know, what are the implications of, of going to a plant-based diet in terms of your health? How could you do that? You don't have to spend a lot of money or time. There's very there's a lot of ways you can do it, but the, some of these books and references may help. Also, Vagino is trying to do that um, specific to Japan. So a lot of the references that I can share are sadly not Japan Based. They originated, you know, from the States or from overseas. And so a lot of the foods they may recommend or recipes they recommend may not be achievable here. And so what we're trying to do is to um, share ideas and recipes about, hey, what can you make for yourself quickly or easily uh, with um, ingredients that um, you can find in most Japanese supermarkets? If you're somebody who wants to do a slow transition, sort of gradual that's also great I think it's the same principle I would still recommend those references but just take it step by step and eliminate what you think uh, is easiest to eliminate you know based on what you like what you don't like or you could say what's the most impactful to the environment and then go backwards from there so maybe you could start with um, eliminating eating beef like I said it's the biggest contributor then maybe you cut out dairy because it's also one of the biggest contributors and then you kind of got work down to eggs and fish and pork poultry not necessarily in that order but that's also another idea but sometimes people when you know they think about moving to a plant-based they, they are worried about missing out on some uh, nutrients what would be your recommendation on, on that so i was worried too i think what people are worried about the most is protein and to put that straight protein 
One, even if you eat meat, there is a lot of science that points to the fact that um, in the 21st century, in most countries, we eat too much protein, whether it's meat or whether it's beans and plant-based. And so people are overly worried about achieving this certain level of protein, but actually we don't even need that much. Um, there is also research showing that whether or not it's plant-based, an excess of protein could lead to higher possibility of uh, creating or turning on cancer cells. And so I would say, first of all, stop worrying about protein because you don't need as much as you think. Um, and then second of all, it is something that I was surprised by this, but it's abundant in quite a lot of plant-based foods. And it's not just tofu, uh, if you're wondering, because that's what I used to think. And it's not just beans. Like broccoli has protein. And I was quite blown away by that. But the, the point is that if you eat a well-balanced diet, including, of course, tofu and beans, but including a lot of different uh, vegetables, you will naturally get the protein level that you need. Um, however, I will say the two things that people are not really worried about, but they will miss out on if they're not careful, is um, vitamin B12 and vitamin D. So one by one, vitamin B12 uh, used to exist readily in soils and so also did exist a couple of decades ago in vegetables and, and plants, so plant-based foods. But due to a whole lot of reasons that I'm not going to go into, it doesn't really, um, it's not really readily available in all soils, let's say. You can't rely on a vegetable or plant to have vitamin B12 anymore. Um, and so these, this is the one nutrient that is not accessible through just eating uh, fruit and veg. How do people get this? Mostly if you eat meat, eggs, dairy, the animals are injected or they're given it through their feed. So it's like a fortified supplement. And then because they have that in their bodies, if you eat their meat, then obviously you get that. And so for the most part, people get vitamin B12 through animal product consumption. However, even if you eat like that, so again, there's research saying that people don't actually get enough vitamin B12. So what we try to say is keep an eye on that. I do a regular blood test and then day to day, I try and eat things that like plant-based cereals, um, or there's something called nutritional yeast that has that specific vitamin and is 100% plant-based. A lot of plant-based people and vegans that I know of, because they don't want to worry so much, they just have a plant-based or vegan vitamin B12 supplement, and they just uh, make sure that they take that every day. The other vitamin that it's very hard to find in plants, let's say, is uh, vitamin D. Again, this isn't to do with soil, but it's not really in plants anyway. And then you get it through the meat because they have it in their feed and it's fortified in their injections or whatnot. The best way to get this is just walk outside. But um, the other thing that I did find out is if you have um, certain types of mushrooms, portobello, don't quote me on this, but there's portobello, I think also uh, shimeji. I can check and share later. Um, but there are two or three kinds of vegetables that are quite common in Japan. If they are sun-grown, then they would have vitamin D. You can't check that something is sun-grown in a supermarket. So uh, every now and again, we do sometimes put our mushrooms out in the balcony for about a day. But yeah, that's kind of how you can keep uh, your intake of vitamin D as well. How do you usually uh, create your meals to ensure like you have all the right nutrients, amino acids and, and things like that? Do you organize that in a way, in a special way? Not really. And that's why, uh, and that's what I like about whole food plant bases. And again, the distinction is not vegan. This is whole foods, 100% plant based where you're not relying on processed foods. This actually works and you don't have to be meticulous about calculation because a lot of fruits and vegetables in their whole state, so if you eat, you know, most of it whole, then you do get a nice balance of what nature has packed for you. And so as long as you're not always eating cucumber for breakfast, lunch and dinner and then eating the same vegetables and fruits day in, day out for all the meals, you rotate that out and you make sure you get sort of a variety, make it colorful. Usually you don't, you shouldn't have to worry. It sounds a bit too good to be true, but there's several people saying this, one of them being Colin Campbell of uh, Cornell University. And uh, it's also backed by research. And this also includes protein levels. So as long as you really sort of just have a balanced diet with a lot of different fruit and veg, 
uh, usually it's okay. The only things to watch out for is, as aforementioned, vitamin B12, vitamin D. Those are things that I do try to consciously take with, uh, for me, it's nutritional yeast uh, for vitamin B12 and sun for vitamin D. We recently got a dog, so that's easy. Um, <laughs> Um, and then because I'm uh, also expecting a kid, um, I do, although I don't really like it, <laughs> I do try and eat, um, walnuts or chia seeds for the omega-3, but that's not really just because of plant-based eating. Uh, by the way, just like a quick question, like where do you find nutritional yeast in Japan? It's a good question. Um, so I could be wrong, but I think... If you're looking for a local company that sources it, I think I've only seen it coming from a company called Alishan. They sell both on their own website and through Amazon, maybe other places, but I only know of those two. We also find nutritional yeast from Amazon. Uh, it tends to be imported, which we like less because of, you know, you don't want to import everything. But yeah, if you look it up online, it's, it's actually not that difficult or expensive to purchase while living in Japan. Some other tips as well, I think, which are easy swaps, like how do you replace um, cream or like things like that uh, with plant-based uh, alternatives? There's different ways you can do it, I think. Now, even in the past one or two years, I've seen a, an increase in also Japanese companies creating these plant-based alternatives, like um, plant-based cheese, milk, for example, soy milk and almond milk has always been here. Um, there is also such a thing as soy-based whipped cream, which I haven't managed to find yet. There's soy and almond-based yogurts readily available in a lot of supermarkets. And then also you can sort of make your own cream with um, uh, soy milk. And then you just basically replace the dairy milk in the recipe with soy milk. And it works for most like um, cream recipes for pasta or lasagna and then we do also i've discovered through blogs and whatnot from overseas that uh, cashew nuts is also a very nice alternative if you soak it up uh blend it with a lot of other condiments like salt lemon nutritional yeast um, and a bit of spices it actually has a cheesy smell and a flavor to it so i could go on like past 8 p.m on how you could swap all these things. To be honest, like my personal journey, I didn't find it easy because I didn't know where to get all this information. So feel free to ask me, feel free to visit our site or follow Instagram. But um, yeah, I do, I do think that it's not that difficult to swap, make these swaps. Um, and they're just as nutritional, most cases, then that's just nutritional and just as tasty. So Anything maybe people who are just starting to pay attention when doing grocery shopping to avoid maybe something uh, that has some meat byproducts. For example, I'm top of my head, I'm thinking about gelatins that can be in some products. Is there other things that people should be worried about? Yeah, that one I think was hard for me as well. I used to spend a lot of time in supermarkets just figuring out whether something was plant-based and then I kind of gave up and that's how I also enjoy whole foods plant-based diet because you just kind of stay in the fresh grocery area and then you're done. Grocery shopping is super fast. But if you are looking for things that, you know, partly processed or processed and packaged foods, gelatin is definitely one to look out for. Um, there is actually a lot more, uh, like, um, I think uh, in Katakana, a lot of things here say something, something ekisu, which often is animal derived. I don't think I've seen something that says something, something ekisu that is not animal apart from maybe plum, ume. So that could be an easy way to stay out. Um, unfortunately, though, the Japanese government, they don't make it mandatory for food companies to list all the ingredients that they uh, use in their production. And so sometimes you could see uh, something processed that looks like it's plant-based, but would have traces of things, but they're so small that they kind of fit outside of the mandatory listing. And so it also kind of depends on how far you want to go to avoid these things. Moving on to another thing that is sometimes challenging in Japan is uh, eating outside. So do you have any tips for finding like vegan or vegetarian friendly restaurants in, in Japan? Unlike a lot of other countries I've been to, um, I think the most famous site called Happy Cow is a little less advanced here. And a little less advanced means... Um, they're still good, but I think it, it seems like they're, um, I, I'm not sure how they work precisely, but I haven't seen a lot of the options that I know to exist to be on that site. Uh, whereas I can recommend sites like Veg, VegWell or Veg Project. Um, 
I'm not sure if they have it in English too. I think they did. Um, also, Google search is is quite uh, friendly. I tend to look at the the reviews, the the comments that people write, because even if it's a completely non plant based restaurant, if if somebody has been there and they said actually this place was really good at making this veganized or plant based, I do try and try that. The other quickest way is to just find a plant based friend. I could be your first one, but um, yeah, it's it's sadly not. I, I don't know of one single site that is super updated um so it's always a combination of these things that i turn to plus friends and word of mouth from your experience uh what are the challenges of going plant-based in japan so for example we were discussing together you know sometimes in the work context it can be challenging can you tell us a bit more about that yeah i think one because of the lack of i wouldn't say lack of choice it's just it's hard to to choose plant-based option Uh, anywhere and everywhere you walk into a supermarket again like you either stay in the fresh produce or you spend a lot of time going through all the lists which I don't think a lot of people would want to do um, you also have the the complication of the fact that depends on the work place I know but Japan generally tends to be a very conformist liking like a you know harmonizing hey everyone let's stay similar type of culture and that does still exist especially in some very domestic uh, environments and so some people find it hard to speak up that they are plant-based and they prefer to you know not eat meat um, whether it's in the nomikai or whether you're taking clients out uh, whether you're receiving that omiyage which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with but somebody would give you a souvenir typically a sweet uh, or like a baked sweet or something when they go somewhere for a holiday and so Um, I think those are challenges and I don't really have an answer to how you would best overcome them. I think part of it is that we just need to be patient and if you're okay with communicating, feel comfortable about it, by all means, I think you should communicate. Um, I think it's nothing to be ashamed of, but if you don't feel comfortable in communicating, then it's kind of up to you how comfortable you feel eating these things or quietly disposing of like omiyage, uh, that kind of stuff. Do you feel like usually people are responding positively to you following a plant-based diet? I've had mixed. I've always been a curious person. And so my friends, and then my friends also used to call me like an alien. Just for context, I'm Japanese and I've lived here a long time, but um, I grew up in the UK. So people kind of always viewed me as different, even among my friends. So when I said, I came back from overseas and I said, oh, you know, I'm plant-based now. They were like, oh, yeah, you Well, based, of course, you yeah. know. Um, so that was, I guess, positive. Yeah, I have also had negative reactions where it's like, is this a religion or a cult? Are you okay? Are you going to survive? Where's the protein coming? You know, uh, so it's mixed. But there's nothing you could do, I think. But do you see like this being more popular in the recent years in Japan? Yeah, happily. Like I said, uh, it used to be, I think, that you could only get, for example, cheese, uh, plant-based cheese alternatives, you know, from import places or sort of expensive, uh, high-end places, health-conscious places. But now, for example, if you go to Eon, A-E-O-N, Eon stores, they have a whole horde of cheese, yogurt, yogurty like things, and soy milk. They, I think they even have oat milk now. This is all in the recent sort of couple of months. Could have been the Olympics. I don't know, but I, I think if it's just the Olympics, supermarkets would not have these um, Japan-made, cheap or affordable animal alternative foods. So it must there must be a growing demand. I have also noticed that celebrities like um, Mizuka Wasami, she's a nice actress. Um, she's actually recently said that she's vegan. There's also another uh, Oaraigeni, or what do you call them, like a comedian, female comedian called uh, Buruzon, Buruzon Chiemi. Again, she said, actually, I've been being here for about two years, but never could speak out. And now I'm speaking out. So in Japan, I think that helps a lot. When celebrities do something, it tends to catch on faster. So yeah, happily in the past year or two, I've seen a lot of indications that um, a lot more people are accepting this as, as lifestyle choices. So you were uh, mentioning that you're expecting. What advice would you give expecting mothers who are following a plant-based lifestyle? Any things to be particularly careful about? I still looked into this to double check that I, I'm okay to stay on a plant-based lifestyle when I found out that I was pregnant. And my conclusion is yes, but I, I do keep tabs on 
nutrition, like blood tests and levels like that. Luckily, my mother-in-law is a doctor, so I kind of can get a second opinion um, where it's hard to ask doctors here about this topic. They don't really know about it. So I would say like, yes, if you've been plant-based, then be careful, but still, I think it's fine. So far, I felt really good. No problem so far. It could just be me. People and pregnancies tend to be very different, uh, so I understand. I would caution if you are not already plant-based and then you find out you're pregnant and you're like, should I turn to plant-based now? I would say that you should be very, very careful because there's so many variables in the pregnancy itself. You don't, it's very hard to monitor. Is this variable? Is this change that I'm experiencing because of pregnancy or is it because of the plant-based, like the switch to plant-based? And so if you're just pregnant and you want to make that change, I would highly caution against. Though eating less meat and less dairy is always a good idea. So that I would say you can go ahead and do. And then, yeah, I, I think that um, anything other than that, uh, interestingly, the list that you're given when you find out you're pregnant of the foods that you should avoid eating, I think all of them were animal-based. So as a consequence of being plant-based anyway, I'm already staying away from like the dangerous foods, you know, like the raw oysters or I don't know, high mercury fish, anything like that. The something cheese, one kind of cheese is something you're advised to stay away with. Again, I'm not eating that anyway. So it's actually easier for me to stay whole foods, plant-based and pregnant. You have to give us your uh, mother-in-law uh, contact details. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even the doctors in Japan, like, it's not that they don't know, right? They just can't give you... It's, I, I find it hard to get proactive advice from them. But if you want to do a sanity check, like, hey, doctor, I think my, you know, this level is okay. Am I on the right track? Or, hey, this level I think is on the low end, is it okay? Like, they're doctors. So, of course, they'll be able to help. But um, you just won't get proactive advice like, hey, if I want to up my levels of iron, what foods can I take? And they will always say, like, liver and, you know, mm -hmm. things that are animal-based. And then the proactive advice that's geared only towards plant-based might be harder to get. Do you plan to raise your kid vegan? <laughs> uh, yeah, in principle, yes. So... I grew up in a world where the default was you eat animals because you do and you need them. I want my child to grow up in a, in a default state of mind where it's not normal or it's not default, um, but understand that people do that and understand that he or she will also have that choice if they want to. I would be very sad if they do, but I don't want to force anything. Plus, I've also realized that um, recent research shows uh, kids that have, this is in the UK and it came to light about two years ago, I think, but the earlier a child is exposed to some of the more common allergy foods like nuts, dairy, eggs, I think there was one more, but statistics shows that they actually have a lower incidence rate of developing allergies towards those products. And after reading that, I don't think I want to deprive my child of um, the chance to not be allergic to things like dairy and eggs, especially if, you know, you can't be sure that, you'll, that they'll always stay away. It might be a choice that they make to start eating it, but also they might accidentally eat it somewhere. And then you don't want to find out in hospital. So in principle, plant-based and vegan, but I think a practice along the way will sort of uh, make it up as we go. What is the best thing about having a plant-based diet from your point of view? Aside from health benefits and I feel great, and I always attribute that to plant-based diet, um, I think that like I have really enjoyed staying plant-based. Um, as I mentioned before, I think um, you know exploring what I can do with the limits. So how can you make cheese melt tasty and creamy but not out of dairy? Like for me, that's an amazing challenge. I'm not a cook, never used to be a cook, but um, I'm spending more time in the kitchen, more so now because of COVID, but like it's, it's just fun for me. And I think part of the reason I've been able to stay passionate about this for so long is just that, you know, I feel great, it's fun. And now I know that I'm actually also mitigating my impact on the planet that um, I do actually like nature and, and animals as well. So Um, it's nice to know that like what I'm doing is as good as I can do, I think, for that. To finish, uh, what resources like books, documentaries, uh, etc. would you recommend on ecology or plant-based diets? There's a lot, but I think the most comprehensive one is to go watch um, Cowspiracy. It's uh, available on Netflix and it basically like will open your mind if you didn't know about any of the stuff that I talked about today or if 
you have doubts about me saying this is all backed by science, like you'll see it again. They also do a very good job of sort of giving you visuals on, hey, this is the impact of, let's say, saving a plastic bag or fixing your uh, leaking waterworks. This is how much water you save. They show you this little graph and then they're like, versus this is how much water you use or cannot save if you eat one hamburger. Um, And then when you see that visual, you're like, I might as well let my tap leak. Don't, but like the impacts are so different that you will see it it just doesn't make sense to not go plant-based to any degree. So cow spirity definitely. And don't be put off by the title. It's like, it only touches on cows a little bit. Um, It's actually fully to do with uh, plant-based and or let's say the implications of eating animal products on the environment. And then in terms of books, I think it's more geared, at least for me, it's more geared towards what you would read if you've already decided that you're curious. But there's a book called How Not to Die. It's available in both Japanese and English. Very practical because it takes you through um, what kinds of foods you should uh, consciously take. So even though I did say just eat a balanced diet, there are some things you should be careful of. And it kind of touches on that very nicely with some recipe ideas at the end. And then there's also another book called The China Study. Um, So Colin Campbell, as I mentioned before, uh, he is the main author of that. And basically it's a, it's a big, it's a big book. So um, if you're not about books, you can also watch Forks Over Knives, uh, which kind of touches on the same subject, but um, it's all about his journey and his research that shows um, plant-based is plant-based whole foods diet. Um, is probably the most healthiest way that uh, you can eat for yourself um, to not have these diseases that are major killers in the world today or even to reverse them. Um, And it's more convincing than just me talking. And then, yeah, in terms of people, apart from Virginia, (laughs) um, I I like to uh, sometimes listen to this guy called Earthling Earthling Ed, or his real name is Ed Winters. He is vegan. Uh, and he's an activist, but I like him because um, his talks are very peaceful, logical, factual. And so he's not imposing. He's not, he, he doesn't make propaganda out of the messages that he's, he's uh, transmitting. And you, I think at some point you'll be convinced or you'll be like, why am I still eating meat? He's a very subtle and, and great person to sort of um, look to for these messages. Thank you for listening. You will find all the notes from the discussion on Motainai Transition website, motainai-transition.com. If you like the podcast, don't hesitate to leave a rating on your favorite podcast app. Matane!